Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Stelios Rodoulis, and I'm the outgoing chairman of the CIHT London region and currently a member of uh, the National CIHT Council and member of the London Committee. Uh, I would like to welcome you uh, to this uh, session. I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to have uh, all the speakers on board. And uh, it's, um, we are, today we're going to be exploring uh, demand responsive transport for rural areas. And uh, DRT is a very expanding field of, uh, of work for and, and it's rising of importance. And uh, that's why the committee, in conjunction with ATCO, um, we decided to put together uh, this event and uh, explore uh, DRT. Uh, next slide, please. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so what is CIHT? CIHT is a charity. We are a learned society and professional membership body. We have uh, approximately 14,000 members and uh, the structure of the CIHT is split within 12 regions plus a few overseas uh, groups, uh, including in the Republic of Ireland, Hong Kong and Malaysia. Uh, CIHT has a strong uh, partnerships network, which includes over uh, 100 uh, corporate partners, such as consultants, academic institutions and of course public sector bodies. Uh, we are also awarded uh, a royal charter in 2009, and uh, you can explore all the qualifications uh, that the institution offers on the website. And uh, next, in, we introduce, and then um, uh, becoming a member can provide a lot of uh, benefits. Um, CIHT is, is, in, is particularly a, quite a multidisciplinary membership organization, and we try to represent uh, the diversity of the sector also. Uh, and you can find uh, a lot of uh, technical information on our website. Uh, you can get access to the professional qualifications and, uh, and of course, you get the, transport, uh, the Transportation Professional Magazine. Um, and, uh, and of course, the, the, uh, the, the becoming a member gives you an opportunity to make your voice heard. And if you're interested in becoming a member, you can go on the website or, um, or just email uh, membership at chd.org.uk. And next is um, James Hopkins will uh, provide an overview of Atcom. Over to you, James. Yeah. Thank you, Sedios. Uh, so, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm James Hopkins. I'm the Vice Chair of ATCO. Um, so ATCO represents uh, local authority offices up and down the country that work in the, the passenger transport field, which is uh, becoming more relevant um, with uh, Bus Back Better and everything that's involved within that. So um, we've been around since 1974 and uh, worked closely with a number of different organisations, including CIHT, um, as well as uh, DFT and DFE, and uh, working closely to feedback the issues of our members uh, directly to central government as well. And uh, pleased to welcome you all today um, for this uh, webinar on DRT, which both Stelios and I are very excited about. Um, next slide, please. Uh, some online etiquette about the event. Uh, we have placed everyone uh, on mute to avoid background noise. Um, the question will be taken after each presentation, uh, but please post your uh, your question using the questions function. That should be well, depending on how you have set up the um, the platform, it's going to appear. The option will appear to you, and uh, the event is recorded, including the Q and A's. Um, and the recording will be uploaded to the member area of the CIHT website. So today's agenda, we are going to start with uh, the first presentation is by the Department for Transport. Uh, we have uh, three speakers actually, and, um, and then followed by presentation uh, by James Hopkins, who just introduced himself. Uh, James works for Essex County Council. And um, yes, bear in mind that due to some connectivity issues, uh, the DFT speakers are joining uh, through a, a mobile phone and we're controlling the slides ourselves. So uh, apologies if the sound quality is not great, but I think it's, I think it's okay. And uh, over to you, Nathan, I believe is first, yeah. Well, thanks, Stelios, it's, it's actually Rachel. Rachel, um, sorry, apologies, yeah. No problem at all, thanks very much. Um, thanks for inviting us today, um, and apologies, um, yes, we, for various technical reasons, we don't seem to be able to access um, go to the webinar, so, so we are doing it over our phones, so 
please somebody interrupt me if, if you have any difficulty hearing. Um, yes, I'm Rachel. I'm Rachel Longley. I'm the lead um, leader team for rural community and demand response Transport. Um, and I'm here alongside my colleague Nathan Cole, who's the policy lead for demand response Transport, and Michael Evans, who will be speaking about B6. Um, so I'm going to give a, a brief overview of the Rural Mobility Fund, um, a DRT pilot which, which is currently running, and um, just a bit about what it's going to achieve and which local authorities have received funding. Uh, Nathan's going to talk a bit about some of the features, the more interesting features of the pilot. Um, and then Nathan and, and Michael will cover a bit about the role of DRT um, in the context of the National Bus Strategy, as, as well as Michael speaking a bit more detail about bus service improvement plans as well. Um, if I can move on to uh, the next slide. Um, so the, the Rural Mobility Fund was, was a commitment made as part of the Better Deal for Bus Users package, which was announced uh, back in September 2019. Um, and, and the purpose of the fund really is to trial DRT in rural and suburban settings, to try to, to better understand the barriers and um, the merits in, in, in areas where the shed, um, traditional services just aren't very viable. Um, I mean, we do see DRT as sort of a great opportunity to find and uh, improve access to servicing, sort of, you know, sort of those wider factors as well that, that we're all particularly aware of at the moment, things around, you know, social inclusion, reducing isolation. Um, so, so we hope that, that it, can, it can support there. Um, we, we were keen to, to fund, uh, for the fund sort of investment schemes that are different from the, the dial ride type services that we have and, and to attract a wide 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 range of, of customers. And um, so the, the competition was launched back in February 2020 and there were, there were 44 local authorities um, proposing 56 different pilots in total. Um, and then there's a, a thorough assessment process and, and from those 17 were selected um, and developed into business cases and, and funding was awarded in March of this year. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, you'll see sort of this quite a spread across the across England. Um, so, so the total funding awarded is about 19.4 million. Um, there's a little bit of fun, further funding available for monitoring and evaluation. Um, I mean, the, the funding was awarded um, based on the scale of each bid, really. So there's, there's quite a, a range in the amount from sort of just over half a million to up to one and a half million. Um, Yes, and, and you'll see from that that they're sort of spread around the country. The, the pilots have, have recently started launching, and this will carry on now until next summer. Um, and then they're expecting, expected to run through to uh, 2024, 2025. Um, and the, there will be a monitoring evaluation, pro evaluation process alongside that. And so we hope that learning from that um, will be able to feed into to DRT um, on an ongoing basis. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll hand over to Nathan now, who I think is going to talk a little bit more about the features of, of these pilots on, on slide four. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, just, I'm having much the same technical issues that uh, my colleagues are having, unfortunately. Um, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm sure we'll find a way of picking them up um, when we get to the, the close of uh, the presentation. Um, so I can't see any chat. Unfortunately. But uh, as Rachel was saying, um, we're doing some quite detailed monitoring and evaluation of these um, pilots. Um, one of the reasons for that is that we want them to cover um, lots of different types of approach and let us look at some of the ways in which it's delivered and work out what works best in different circumstances. There's not going to be a one size fits all for this sort of thing. But one of the key things we were looking for in these pilots was getting people uh, to be better connected to things like healthcare and work. So I think we're going to hear a bit more from James later about Essex. And if you look at the bid that was for Central Essex, uh, one of the key things in that was some better connections to Broomfield Hospital. And when it comes to getting people to work, there's a connection to a business park, which is something that uh, the non-RMF um, the RT pilots we've seen in recent years have been very keen on doing. Um, if you look up in Warwick, um, there's 
um, an IBM and a Volvo factory and getting people to those employment opportunities is one of the things that um, the pilots can enable um, in areas where it's not always easy to get to on the edge of town. It's, you know, things are built with the car in mind. They're not necessarily easy to access by bus or other forms of public transport. It's not just about access to work. I think there's a bit of play involved as well in some of these pilots. Um, some of the bids have had leisure destinations uh, in mind. So if you look at Staffordshire scheme, which I believe is going to launch fairly shortly, possibly next month, maybe even this month, um, that takes in uh, the Peak District National Park, which um, oh, has been sort of an echo here, sorry about that. Peak District National Park, um, so that people have got better access to the outdoors and it's helping to reduce some um, uh, dependency on cars in the, those sort of heavily tourist rural areas. One of the other things we've been keen to see, and that's come across in some of the bids and other features, is how you connect people into other transport hubs so that they can do onward journeys, um, say on the National Rail Network, which is one of the things that Wilshire's pilot is going to um, focus on. The Royal Mobility Fund, despite its name, wasn't just about those areas of what you might call extreme rurality, um, where there's a sort of desert of, of public transport. It's taken in some of the more fringe areas and suburban areas around the edge of a town, where it just starts to cross over into the more rural areas. And some of those areas are where new builds are going up. Because, you know, we have a housing crisis and we're, we're looking to get new new developments going forward. So if you look at what's happening in Buckinghamshire, one of their bids uh, will support the development of 16,000 new homes around Aylesbury. And certainly when you're looking at getting public transport into areas where a bigger vehicle can't go, or perhaps where you're starting to uh, build a new development where there isn't a big demand straight away, um, DRT is something you can use to do that, and that's one of the things in the pilots. Um, also, you know, there's that little bit of flexibility where people started to get some sort of public transport habits. So we're also looking at some of the other aspects or characteristics of what you might get from a good DRT service. You want to try some of those out. So if you look at what's going on in Surrey, they've been intending to use some electric minibuses, which will help with uh, the broader decarbonisation agenda. And then you can encourage use through some more sort of luxurious or, or top end specifications. And we've seen uh, things like leather seats and Wi Fi and USB charging involved with some, some of the pilots. And going back to Staffordshire, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, they've looked at including cycle racks on their vehicles as part of that leisure opportunity. And you can also um, connect people to retail offers. I think uh, there was a scheme, one of the pilots was looking at perhaps having vouchers for cinemas to sort of encourage a nighttime economy approach. So looking beyond the actual passenger side of these pilots, um, we've also had um, a bid in Cumbria um, that was looking at some of the non-passenger transport aspects. So you would be looking at delivering things like parcels or medication, connecting it into sort of local libraries, um, you know, mobile libraries, that sort of thing. And that's got a broader connection to a piece of work that the department did that you may remember from a couple of years ago called Total Transport. And that encourages local authorities, um, operators, and particularly the NHS to work in a more holistic way and link up together to provide some more effective and maybe wider services. And there's a bit of renewed interest in that at the moment, which I'll, I'll just take a moment to flag. Um, the NHS has done some work recently on um, non-emergency patient transport. And we'd certainly encourage people to, to look at how they can take forward you know, transport principles when we think about DR, DRT going future. There's also been um, some experimentation outside the Rural Mobility Fund um, where operators have converted standard bus services, as it were, to 
Uh, the demand response to transport's a way of coming back from the COVID pandemic and giving them more flexibility and maybe even allowing a bit of social distancing. And we're starting to get some interesting sort of ideas around that as well. And so I think there's, there's a renewed interest in DRT now. Um, we've got new apps. And I think the, the stars may have aligned to make it a bit more of a realistic proposition than perhaps it's been in the past because we have seen a few false starts down the years on this sort of thing. And certainly it's, it's something that we would be looking to uh, people's bus service improvement plans in response to the national bus strategy as perhaps a potential uh, option of what they could do. Um, we know it's not going to be a panacea in, in every circumstance, but there's, there's lots of scope there, I think. And I'll just step aside now and hand over to Michael, who's going to say a bit more about the National Bus Strategy and the bus service improvement plans that people are going to be submitting for that. Thank you uh, very much, Nathan. I hope you can all hear me um, on, on, on the call. Um, I will continue unless anyone else says otherwise. So. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about the National Bus Strategy, which we published in March uh, this year. So the strategy it sets out the government's vision for bus services across England uh, and is backed by £3 billion worth of investment during this Parliament. And essentially the, the strategy uh, sets out that we are determined that great bus services should be available to everyone, everywhere, uh, regardless of, of where they might live. And our, and our primary aim, I suppose, is to increase patronage uh, to improve services for passengers and attract uh, non-bus users as well. And to do that, uh, buses must be seen as more attractive and practical, uh, a practical alternative to the car. And, and so the strategy explains how we will make them more frequent, reliable, uh, easier to understand and use, better coordinated and, and cheaper. Um, so I was brought on the call to talk about bus service improvement plans uh, and, and, and this was born out of the National Bus Strategy and it's how we are going to deliver the outcomes that we want to achieve. So all English uh, local transport authorities outside London are developing bus service improvement plans, BSIPs for short, uh, in collaboration with their local bus operators. So these, these plans should set out local visions uh, for the step change in services that is needed, uh, crucially driven by what passengers and would-be passengers want in their area. Now, these plans should be published by the end of this month, by the 31st of October. And we have specified that the plans should be developed by local authorities uh, in collaboration with their bus operators, uh, community transport bodies, uh, local businesses and local people as well. Um, and so from April 2022, uh, access to a share of the three billion, um, which we announced for the strategy, will be available only to areas uh, who have completed their BSIP and who are either in an, an enhanced partnership, um, a partnership with their bus operator, or pursuing franchising. So these are statutory um, arrangements. And I'm pleased to say that all English LTAs outside London have confirmed that they are developing either or both of these approaches. So this is how the ambitious improvements identified in the BSIP uh, will be delivered. Um, and, and to support local authorities in forming their partnerships and to develop their plans, uh, we are making £25 million available in 2021 to 22. Uh, to help with their sort of capacity and capability to deliver the plans and the partnership slash statutory uh, arrangements um, as well. So I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't touch upon our aspirations and ambitions for DRT in a bit more detail, although I know Nathan has already done that. Um, but I, I, I think for us, you know, we, we see DRT potentially serving places that are currently unserved or barely served by by conventional buses. In the strategy, we say that we will uh, seek to support this. Um, as well, safety is very important, obviously. Um, so, so we set out how the bus sector must strive for the highest safety standards to support personal safety and security um, of every passenger. And, and we consider that the provision of DRT services in the evenings and late at night could help to support this as well. And then through BSIPs, we, we expect local authorities to work with operators to set 
the daytime, evening and Sunday service levels that different community needs. Um, and in some cases, these services could be provided by DRT, uh, integrated with conventional buses um, where they exist. And in the strategy, there, there is a commitment in there for us to learn from the Rural Mobility Fund pilots and then to use that learning to consider further expansion and further piloting um, in, in the future. Um, we published a suite of guidance around uh, BSIP development, um, including uh, sort of he headline messages to aid BSIP drafting. Um, and, and so we have asked local authorities in their plan to, to set out you know, their plans for increasing DRT services um, and an explanation behind that decision as well. You know, these, these are outline plans which we expect to be reviewed and, and developed going forward. Um, and, and I think that, that was pretty much it in terms of the strategy and BSIPs. Um, so that concludes my, my part of the presentation, I think. Uh, thank you to all the DFT speakers. Um, we can take some questions now. Um, so the first question is, uh, what lessons have been learned from the existing rural community transport sector uh, across the UK? Uh, and um, because many of these schemes find themselves increasingly picking up health and well-being um, well -being needs. Uh, so, yeah, have there been any lessons learned from the existing rural transport? Sorry, Stelios, could you, could you repeat, repeat that question? I had double touching it. Sure. Um, it's uh, what lessons have been learned from the existing rural community transport sector across the UK? Um, has any knowledge going to, from the, has any lessons learned from, from uh, rural transport being translated into the plans going forward? Sorry, Stay, I'm having real difficulty hearing the question. I'm, I'm just, uh, just to see if colleagues are able to hear. <laughs> um, if I, I just jump in, I, I think um, the question was about um, lessons learned from sort of existing community transport um, provision in rural areas. And I think I, I would just say, um, from that perspective, that you know, DRT is a fairly broad church these days and it, it's not just about what you might think about as the more traditional so we say sort of dial -a ride services that have been provided down the years there are there are newer ways um, of doing this so it, it, it's it's quite a broad church um, the rural mobility pilots a lot of them are using um, sort of like more modern app based approaches rather than perhaps the old school volunteer um, community transport approach but I'll let Rachel say if there's anything there on the community transport side of the RT um, that she can refer to. Thanks Nathan. Um, no I think I think you sort of summarised it well there it is pretty broad. Um, I think we obviously want want to explore further how and encourage consideration really of how CP um, can work with with LCAs and, and others to you know to, in the form of DRT um, and there's, there's potentially quite a lot of scope there for, for um, collaboration. I know, I know there already is quite a lot of collaboration there, um, but that's, that's, that's certainly something we want to um, think more about going forward and, and encourage. Oh, thank you. And uh, the next question is, um, <clears throat> so DRT typically involves a lot of upfront uh, setup costs and ongoing subsidy to run uh, smoothly. Uh, is a three billion commitment to the bus pack better going to be enough for DRT and all the, out and all the other outcomes sorts? Sure, I, I can speak to that. And if Rachel or Nathan wants to chip in, then be, be my guest. Um, so I think you know the three billion that we've uh, announced, you know, is, is sort of you know, quite unpre quite unprecedented, and I and I think that you know beyond the three billion, uh, you know, you know, I think I think 
the message is our commitment and our and our ambitions uh, remain. And and the message really is, you know, to be as ambitious and as, as possible in, in your bus service improvement plan. You know, outline the changes that are needed in in your area. And if if that includes DRT, then then please put that in there. You know, put forward your plans for the sort of short term, but then also the medium to long term as as well. Um, so, so if we're looking beyond the three billion, you know, appreciate it's quite difficult, but but you know, I can't really comment sort of beyond that at the moment. But what I would say is that, you know, the commitment and ambition around this very much uh, remains. So my advice would be, in the first instance, to put it all in your plan, and provide it to to us, and and then you know we, we'll take it forward from from there. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I, I just agree with that. I think, um, you know, the three billion is, is, is the commitment, um, and you know, we hope and think that will allow people to, or we hope that encourages ambition um, in the bus service improvement plan. Um, and that that sort of that is, you know, the, the bus money that we're working with um, going forward. I think one thing I'll just throw in as more sort of a point of interest, really, was that with the Rural Mobility Fund pilots, um, we encouraged, after the sort of four-year trial period uh, ended, people to include in their bids, you know, what happens next, effectively? Have you got an exit strategy? What, what do you intend once you've done this? How do you intend to make this um, a regular feature? Or what will you do if you find that perhaps this wasn't the right answer after all? So I think I'll just like that for the rural mobility fund aspect. Uh, thank you to the DFT speakers. Uh, we've run out of time uh, to, to answer. There was one more question um, in the chat box, but we move on to the uh, to the presentation by James Hopkins um, um, at Essex County Council. So thank you for the DFT speakers. Um, and uh, if we have time, we can ask. Uh, we can come back for any questions. And uh, to introduce James, uh, James is the leads the business development uh, team within the Integrated Passenger Transport Unit at SX County Council, and uh, developing a DRT uh, solution for SX has been a flagship project uh, for him and the council. Uh, James has uh, about uh, 10 years of experience in the transport sector, and he has experience in project management, um, and uh, especially around the home school um, and other social care transport. Um, so yeah, over to you, James. Thanks, Elias. Um, I will just looking for the share screen. There we go. Okay, hopefully you can, can you see that Stelios? Yes, James, yeah, proceed. Perfect, okay. Okay, so uh, thank you for that introduction Stelios and uh, thank you to our dear colleagues as well um, for the presentation just now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, digital DRT efforts in Essex and what we've done um, over the last few years and, and the current project that we're working on. Uh, so, it's a, bit, a bit of an overview about Essex and Hull to start with, so I'm sure in many areas um, you know, we have some actually public transport provision and um, contrary to sort of popular view, is Essex is predominantly rural, um, but we do have some very densely populated urban areas, so uh, rural mobility and uh, DRT is a little bit for us uh, in Essex to try and deliver that new perception of mobility, removing working to uh, get people away from their cars and to enable journeys to be made that, that aren't currently. Uh, so DRT in itself, an analog DRT is not something uh, new to Essex, but uh, we've had five DRTs in Essex for quite some time now over the last decade, we've, we've added extra services to that. And they all have different characteristics as we've touched on before is that there's not one solution to an area, so they're all tailored to the, the specific geography or population demographics. Um, but we've demonstra uh, demonstrated year on year growth in, in passenger numbers pre COVID. And uh, one of those services did become one of the, the, the first commercially viable DRTs in the country. So um, there's good success there. And we've worked to build on that uh, in, in the last couple of years with 
a couple of pilots uh, to test the digital passenger facing app uh, platform for services for students. So we trialled one at uh, a, a secondary mainstream high school and also another at a, a local uh, post 16 college. Uh, the, the, the college was uh, services to and from train stations to enable people to uh, finish their journey completely by public transport rather than having to rely on the car. And uh, the uh, secondary school was home to school transport. Um, and the idea was just to test the, the concept of the feasibility and to, to gain some early lessons learned um, before we uh, marched on to our sort of wider vision, which incorporated some of the uh, rural mobility funding. So the lessons that we did learn from that are there on screen. The, the big one for us was that the parents and students really liking the ability to track their minibus in real time. Um, everyone gets a, you know, an allocated time when it's going to arrive, but that's not always, as we all know, uh, the case. It doesn't turn up bang on that time. So um, th that was something that came back really strongly from both of those from both of those pilots. And uh, whilst obviously we were focusing on a, a younger uh, age group, digital inclusion was definitely something. Um, that would be central to our future efforts and making sure that other user groups are included um, and given more time and support to make that transition to this type of service uh, rather than their cars. Um, and the combination of an evidence-based approach. So with the, the, the choosing of the two pilot sites, we looked at um, where the vehicles were traveling, the number of students, the routes, the makeup um, as part of that choice and combining all of that expertise together with bus planning and behavioural research and analytics, we were able to come up with a, a successful pilot um, rather than perhaps just choosing an area because um, we might have been directed that way. So the, the data-led approach is definitely the way we wanted to take things forward thereafter. So um, our efforts in terms of the Royal Mobility uh, Fund, we received uh, 2.575 million for the, the two schemes that were successful, so South Branch and Central Essex, which uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about as we progress on through the uh, presentation. Um, the idea was to connect largely with both of them to level up in areas where there's no or little um, public transport provision currently. Anything that is in those areas, apart from a couple of services, is supported by the County Council. Um, and combined with that sort of digital uh, forward thinking solution, we've always also combined it with a, a fleet of fully electric minibuses. So speaking to those green credentials and the uh, safer, greener, healthier ethos that we have at Essex, um, which covers a lot of our highways and transport work uh, more broadly. So uh, moving directly on to the two schemes. Uh, so we'll start with the Central Essex Square or Central Essex proposal uh, that we have. So um, this particular area of Essex is um, low density, obviously predominantly rural. Um, there's not even what you probably class as suburban there. Um, there aren't any high frequency services. Um, there are some supported services that run a few times a week or every two or three hours. But the, on the border around the whole area, as you'll see in a moment, um, there is significant congestion and there was an opportunity to introduce a DRT in this area so that people can connect to those boundaries and then join the high frequency bus services that do exist um, on, on the edge. So enabling, again, people to take that end-to-end -end journey through a public transport or sustainable means. Um, and as I think Nathan touched on earlier, there were a number of high profile um, employment centres, uh, again, around or just outside the area. So uh, moving directly on to um, the, the map, we've got here. So the uh, pink outline is the sort of boundary of our operational area. So um, to the sort of north, you've got uh, Braintree, South Chelmsford, and then over to the, the west, you've got Stansted Airport. Um, and the, the black lines that you can see on the map are existing bus routes. Um, and it looks like there's a, a reason, reasonable amount, but if you look at these ones sort of in the south of the area, um, these are the ones that run a few times a week, um, which you know, to most residents isn't going to meet their needs. And then the ones here that run through Ford End and Barnston are um, high frequency services that run from Stansted Airport all the way down through to South End, Chelmsford South End, Basildon. So they they don't stop very often, but there is that connection ability. So um, the concept here was very much about how can we offer 
people of DRT solution to get to the uh, some of the yellow highlighted dots you can see on the map, the key pinch points where someone can then take an onward journey either by bus uh, or by, by train. And the other thing with this one is uh, once mm -hmm. it's up and running, which will be shortly after um, Christmas, will be um, it will run 24-7. Uh, so there was a lot of interest and things we wanted to explore around Broomfield Hospital and Stansted Airport in terms of uh, shift work and uh, people shifts finishing through the night or starting during the night. So um, again, there was potentially an opportunity there um, for people who are working at unsociable hours that may not then want to necessarily drive or might be tired, you know, reduce that risk um, and they can travel sustainably instead. Um, and then during the evening, um, the service will run down to uh, this green dot at the bottom to the Chelmsford Railway Station uh, between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. So during those times, obviously, the, uh, the DRT wouldn't be competing with conventional bus services. But again, it would allow people to travel into London or, or anywhere along um, the train line to um, then make their way back in the evening again, not having to worry about the car. You might want to go into London for the theatre, so that kind of thing. Is that starting to come back uh, post pandemic? So there's a lot of options there, and this is our, 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 our bigger uh, scheme out of the two, um, and we'll run with four uh, electric minibuses on this service. Uh, so this, this slide covers, I think, largely everything that I've said. All of the um, booking for the service will be through an on-demand um, app, and payment will also be through that option. Uh, we do have backup uh, telephone booking service as well, uh, for anyone who can't access, but it will be digital by default um, and the standard. Okay, and then the, the second scheme of the two is uh, South Branchery. So this one similarly has um, uh, similar characteristics, but there are um, some differences. So there are three business or industrial parks in this area, which have no public transport at all. Um, two exist in the one horizon that's currently being built um, very rapidly. And they're due to um, have the, well, they've already got their first tenants in there, and, and there's more coming over the, the next couple of years. Um, so again, we had a great opportunity there to work with existing sites to change their behavior, travel behaviours, and a new site to get in there first before those car habits are formed. Um, and similarly, the, the similarities there obviously is a, a lack of high frequency uh, services in the area. So uh, this is the map of the area. So um, all the same. In terms or legend in terms of the way it's laid out, much smaller area in terms of geography. Um, as you can see, we've got um, mainly sort of three villages to cover, so Rain, Great Notley, and Black Notley there. Um, so anyone can request a journey inside the area to A to B. Um, but with the uh, dots that sit outside, so the community hospital, the bus station, the rail station, uh, people can take a journey to that and back. Um, so again, we're not operating in an urban area to begin with um, and again the concept here is to complement the existing uh, bus and rail network not to compete with it so we're bringing people that wouldn't ordinarily uh, travel that way they probably just jump in their car um, particularly these areas that are reasonably uh, highly affluent so um, more leaning towards their car use um, we can get them onto onto public transport um, and then around the edge you can see so here uh, the blue dot is the new Horizon Business Park. A bit further down, you've got Skyline, and then there's the Springwood Estates, more towards the north. Um, and the, the benefit, which I really should mention about both of these services, is they're both built around uh, the UK's first electric forecourt um, run by GridServe. That's right up next to Horizon, and uh, we've been working closely with them. So having that as a base uh, where our vehicles will be kept and, and charged, um, directly between the two uh, areas of operation um, was a massive asset for us in our bids and enabled us to go with a, a fully electric service. Um, and obviously it's not shown on here, but this area to the left is the central Essex area. So it butts right up against to the, the South Branchery area. So we'll run them as separate schemes, but over time we might be able to develop into something further. So it has lots of opportunity and potential um, as, as the schemes progress. Um, this area, the South Branchery one, will run seven days a week as well, but it'll be from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, and I think I've covered everything else 
that's already on screen. It'll be the same system, the same booking app. So people don't have to download different ones for different services. It will all be connected. Um, and then finally, just to, to, to conclude on this point, is that uh, um, the app will be provided by Moveit. Um, and what we're going to be doing is integrating this into a wider piece, a wider strategic piece of the council uh, around a, a multi, multimodal journey planning app. Um, so again, that residents are going to one place uh, for looking at looking at the journeys, booking their DLT, that kind of thing, and that can progress and run alongside some of the the, uh, the bus back better um, projects that uh, obviously all of us will be putting forward um, by the end of the month. Um, Another key thing which we've learned from our previous pilots, which we're also weaving in here, is the, the marketing campaign being sustained. So it won't just be uh, a big launch at the start and then fizzle out. It will be sustained all the way through the two years that we're going to run these ones for. And, and our aim is to get as close as possible to being commercially viable or break even by the end of that period. So that's our ambition. We, we, we fully recognise we're, we're aiming high with that, um, but we've got to try. So um, we think with the, the data and the work that went into choosing these areas um, that we've got a great opportunity um, for that to, to be successful. I think that's my last slide, Stelios. Uh, thank you, James. And uh, we have a few questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, I think actually, I, I guess it was inspired by your presentation, but it's a question for the DFT. Um, so for the DFT speakers, I mean. So DRT presently has no funding, uh, has no funding support for electric minibuses, uh, similar to the 75% uh, price difference support that the larger buses are allowed. So the question to the DFT is whether such funding is likely to emerge like it is in Scotland, which is essentially support for um, electric minibuses procurement. I don't know if somebody from the DFT oh, can... Yeah, thanks, Delias. We, we're aware um, it, it's something that um, is, 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 is on our radar, um, electric vehicles more broadly, obviously, going forward. Um, so it's, it's something that, that's on our radar at the moment. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for James. And um, what are the typical costs uh, or, or fares for the Central Essex Square uh, DRT? Uh, so we've not um, launched our, our first uh, system for it yet, but uh, both areas will operate under the same fare structure, again, to avoid confusion for residents. Um, but they will be comparable um, to a bus. So they'll be based on uh, grouped mileage ranges. Um, so sort of, you know, not two miles, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so we haven't published those as yet, but uh, they'll be comparable to a, to a bus service or slightly lower probably at the start because we'll be looking to do some promotions and uh, you know, entry level um, marketing tactics to get people to use the service initially. Thank you, James. And uh, again, a question for James. Uh, do you, do you uh, envisage um, any developer funding for the ongoing operation of DRTs? I assume the, this is a more about um, uh, developers' contribution, like Section 106 contributions to operate uh, DRT. It's a really good question. And I think it's something that um, all authorities should be starting to look at. So um, obviously, some processes in different areas are better than others. For, um, getting in early as part of the Section 106 or, or other funding contribution discussions. Um, but this should definitely be on the radar, particularly where there are new, bigger developments happening in some of the more rural areas. Uh, this kind of service or, or delivery model is perfect um, to be having those discussions with. So um, I, would, I would certainly recommend it um, and to be looking at, because we think, and something I, I didn't mention in the presentation, is that you know uh, DRT or digital DRT is not the the solution to every transport problem we have, but we need both. We need that and conventional high frequency services together. And very much we see this type of model that we've discussed for our two areas um, as something we want to, our ambition to roll out in, in more areas in Essex, um, because residents need to feel that they can make their journeys reliably and sustainably. And if the whole area is not covered by something that's available, you know, 
seven days a week, not quite 24 seven. Does this no, it won't be applicable everywhere, but you know, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. where I can get around freely for my journeys and not have to think, oh, I need to wait an hour or I need to wait two hours. They're not going to do it. So if, we, if we're serious about that modal shift change, um, we need to have this kind of service in those rural and suburban areas. And Section 106 is a, is a perfect way to um, kickstart that process. Thank you, James. Um, the next question is uh, how many vehicles which will each um, DRT scheme use and how many passengers do you expect daily? Uh, so the central letters we use four electric minibuses and the south branch we use two. Um, we've got options to, to bring in more if we need to um, based on the demand, but uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves first, let's get it out the door and get people using it. Um, so in terms of numbers, um, trying to remember off the top of my head, but we're hoping for uh, a couple of hundred trips a day for each scheme. Uh, it varies, obviously, the South Branch is slightly lower than the Central Essex, um, but that's what we're hoping to achieve. Um, probably after about a year, I would say, because we've got to, I'll say, we've got to build that demand up because we're, we're introducing a brand new service that people don't know about, don't currently have or use. So um, there, there's uh, going to be a sort of gradual ramping up but I'd say a few hundred trips a day would be our expectation on sort of mid to mature demand uh, towards the end of year one. Great, thank you. And um, any issues uh, getting drivers, hiring drivers for the DRT schemes, I guess is a, it's become a, a question for every single business in the UK, in fact, yeah, I'll let you answer it. Yes, yeah, so, well, I think you hit the nail on the head, so it's, it's, it's a everybody problem, but uh, we're about to, begin our recruitment campaign. So we're, we're specifically using some of our marketing monies to deliver a driver recruitment campaign so um, we can try and get over some of those issues and also bring in new people to the driver market by offering the, the necessary training funded um, to enable them to, to drive our minibuses on this service. So um, I think we'll be okay. We, we run an in-house uh, fleet called Yuga Bus and uh, numbers of drivers there have been steady and, and where we require them. So. Um, we, we're putting this in as a proactive measure to make sure that we do get the drivers we need um, and then we'll, we'll see how we go. And the next question is around the commerciality of uh, what happens if the schemes aren't viable after two years uh, and is there a plan in that case, in that scenario, uh, to carry on the services? Yeah, great question. So um, we've committed to a review point just before the end of that two years to see where we've gotten to. And there are a, a broad range of options on the table. One could be to wind them both up. Uh, one could be to, to carry them on and the council to, to fund the deficit. Uh, it'll probably be, I imagine, somewhere in the middle uh, if we don't achieve our objectives. Obviously, we are, that's gonna be our, our, our goal. But uh, if we don't, there's there's opportunities for funding from other sources. So, uh, or potentially we can change the, the size of the geographical areas that we cover, or we could increase or, or reduce the number of vehicles and drivers. There's lots of different um, permutations depending on the circumstance. Um, but again, choice of the two areas has been very deliberate, um, not only around local needs, but as well as sustainability going forward, because we know there are expansion options and other businesses that might be interested in uh, supporting the service to encourage their employees or their visitors to um, access the service if it came out and reached out to them. So um, that's probably where we're going to be looking if, if we don't achieve break even or, or commercial viability by the end of the two year period. Thank you, James. And um, how did uh, your team scope uh, or set the area, the operational areas uh, that form the DRT operational area? Um, did you do this internally or bring in experts? Uh, so it was a joint effort between us, uh, Jacobs, um, a number of uh, DRT technology suppliers as well, um, and between all of us and our different expertise and insights around analytics and having run these types of services before and local knowledge of the area, um, and also bringing on the, the local district councils too, um, we were able to, to, to come up with that. So it wasn't just the county council on its own, it was very much um, a partnership working piece um, between all of those different parties. Thank you. And um, with the scale of development in South Braintree, were developer contributions sought or used to develop the service? Uh, no, 
uh, not at this point, uh, so with the timescales we had to, to get something in very quickly, um, we, we focused on developing it in, in, and if there are opportunities for um, developer monies later down the line that might sustain the service or enable us to expand it and, and reach more people, then uh, very much we would be looking to explore that, but uh, at the time there wasn't the, uh, the time or capacity to, to go that route. Yep. And uh, will, will fares um, be paid uh, through the Move It Up? Yes. Yeah, that's an easy, easy question, easy answer to that. And um, how do hourly operating costs compare to fixed route services? Um, I guess, again, this is a, a quite a, 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 we probably need a, a separate session to dissect this, but uh, not sure. Can you do you have an answer on that? Or no, I sure? think right, I think that would need a separate session. But I think you know, obviously, we we all like to do these comparisons, and I get why we do them because it, it makes sense to to you know uh, look at the cost effectiveness effectiveness of different delivery models. But um, I think we also, and probably more here than perhaps other areas, we need to look at what meets the residents needs to actually enable them to use these types of services because we can put in a service that's the most cost effective but actually if residents don't want to use it because it doesn't meet their needs because it goes every hour or two hours then it's a waste of money anyway so i think as a slightly a, an answer to a slightly different question there but uh, i think we um sometimes we and you know because we, we're pushed into that by budget constraints and whatnot but we have to look at these things more from that side and then come up with uh, the right solution that will get people to use it so um you know I, I don't think there's a huge amount of difference between the different cost bases but uh, you know you, you're not going to run an every 15 minute service for a rural area because it just isn't the numbers so um yeah it's that balance i think coming back to that point earlier of we need both drts and high frequency bus services combined to have an effective public transport network and also just to add to this is that the, all the projects uh, that are going to be under the Rural Mobility Fund, um, we, th there's going to be a, uh, an assessment, a detailed assessment of all the schemes and a sort of benchmarking, uh, uh, setting a baseline and then a benchmarking eventually. Uh, it's going to be a multi-year exercise. So by the end of the Rural Mobility Fund, we might get to see some data around this exactly about this question. Next question, uh, sorry, bear with me. Um, for a scheme to be successful, um, according to your experience, James, what is the wait time for a, ser for a DRT service? Uh, well, that's very much something I guess that we're, we're gonna be testing as part of these pilots um, uh, would be the, the, the short answer. Um, I mean, personally, um, you know, if I was using the service and I wanted to go now, you know, I wanted to go where, to work or wherever it might be, or something that's not necessarily pre-planned, um, then you know, 10, 15 minutes, I probably want to want, wouldn't want to wait more than that. And I guess with that question, it's always got to be what would the resident think, um, rather than us as you know, transport professionals and uh, uh, and uh, clever people in that field. But um, yeah, that for me would be the case. But there is a balance, and it depends on who you're trying to reach and for what purpose. So that's for me. But someone in a different demographic might be prepared to wait a little bit longer and there might be others that want it in 30 seconds which we all know is not going to happen but um so I, I think pair it back more to who is the customer segment you're targeting first to to give you the answer to that question and um does a return trip need, need to be booked or planned when an outbound trip is booked or can that be done later and what would be in that case the response waiting time uh, so that can be done uh, they, they can be singles or, or you can book both journeys at the same time um, that's completely up to the user and we've also got the option uh, here that someone can book it on demand you know as, as it's meant to be for sort of 10 minutes time or if someone wants to book up to two weeks in advance they can as well so again that because we've got two very different demographics in the in the areas we're, we're targeting um, one of them will probably prefer, we believe will prefer uh, booking in advance because that's what they're used to and others that uh, will be quite happy to just see if something's available and go for it uh, at the time. So um, the, the expected time at the other end of the day will be 10 to 15 minutes, but it will be based on um, 
the availability of the vehicles and the you know the usage of the service so the app will inform the, the potential passenger of when that journey would be available when it would pick them up so they can then make that choice um, as to whether it's for them or not or or they want to stay a bit longer shopping or or whatever it might be um, they, they can make that choice and I think that's the nice bit about that is they have control of their choice as opposed to not knowing what's coming or what's available and uh, the next question is great great question is that uh, do you feel there will be a challenge to get people to understand how drt works and why they should use it because it's not a bus it's not a taxi and uh, yeah great question yeah 100 percent. yes there will be and a, a huge part of the marketing will be uh, an education piece um to enable residents to understand what it is and what it's offering um and to effectively create that new service or that new space in their heads um, so that they don't think of it as a taxi and they don't think of it as a conventional bus. So um, yeah, there's going to have to be some very clever stuff uh, going on there. We've got quite a lot planned already around that in terms of uh, video briefs and, um, and other uh, cool little tricks that we're, we're planning. So, um, but a lot of that will also be, I think, face-to-face -face engagement. So um, we need to put the time in. We can't just rely on few leaflets or a few social ads there's got to be something more than that um, and we because we have the funding and we've budgeted for that within our bids um, we've got the luxury of doing that uh, on this occasion and I think that is time for maybe one more question and what's the range of the electric minibus and uh, will they need to charge multiple times per day uh, so we're planning on, on a charge per day uh, based on the, the number of journeys we're planning um, we're expecting around 120 to 140 miles per vehicle per charge. Um, the uh, that's, that probably doesn't sound a lot, um, but obviously the in the we're not going to be doing the kind of mileage that a conventional bus would. Um, the area, so for example, the Braintree area is I think seven or nine kilometres square. It's not very big, so all the journeys can be very short. So if you put it in that context, we fall to the the demographics of what we're offering. Central Essex is bigger, but then we've got more vehicle coverage. Um, and the benefit of having the electric forecourt is we um, we have the ability to rapid charge, so we can get up to an 80% charge in 20 to 30 minutes, which uh, all drivers need to have a break anyway legally. So um, that can be on charging whilst they're having their brakes. We've got facilities there for them to do that as well. So um, yeah, we've, that that really is key. But if we can make that work, you know, electric forecourts are going to become presumably the norm in areas. They're going to uh, spring up in, in much bigger numbers. So um, if we can make it based around one of those provisions, then then that technically that kind of model could work anywhere. Um, there are new newer electric minibuses that are coming that do even longer ranges than what we're doing. Um, so you know the future's bright in that regard. And the last question, I, I picked this one because it's very interesting. And uh, if we haven't, um, feel free to email directly both myself and James uh, um, to, to answer any questions. So last question before we go on a break, um, is, there, uh, is there a possible displacement for private taxi operators in this scheme? And um, how have they been involved in the conception, design and development of the DRT schemes? It's a really good question. Um, again, the honest answer will be, I guess we won't really know until we've uh, we've started the effects, but we're, we're not offering a taxi service. And I think that comes back to that education piece that we talked about, about um, you know talking to residents about what we're offering. We're offering a, a new form of shared public transport in a, in a rural or suburban area. Um, it's not a door-to-door -door taxi. Um, and obviously it doesn't come with the price of that taxi either. So um we we operate in a different slightly different um market or segment compared to where a taxi would be um so and actually there might be in the future if you think about this long term if this becomes a much bigger thing in a, in a broader area we're going to want different types and shapes and sizes of vehicles so actually the you know the taxi market could come into this later down the line um depending on the, the deliverability of it we know that some of our manual DRTs do have taxi-shaped vehicles and minibus-shaped vehicles on, on their DRTs, again, depending on what the type of booking is. So there's potential to bring them into it at a later stage, um, but we're not intending to, uh, to, to compete with them. 
Thank you, James, and uh, thank you to all the to all the DFT speakers. Uh, we are gonna go now on a break and rejoin, restart the session in uh, well 28 minutes to be exact. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for for joining, and hope to see you again in half an hour. <laughs>